Welcome to Saving America, and this is your host, Dr. David D. Shine. We have with us today a very impressive individual. Jeffrey A. Tucker is founder and president of the Brownstone Institute and the author of many thousands of articles in the scholarly and popular press. He has written 10 books in five languages, most recently, Liberty or Lockdown. He is also the editor of The Best of Mises. He speaks widely on topics of economics, technology, social philosophy, and culture. Welcome, Jeffrey. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us. And as you know, we do three questions in our, in our guest interviews. Uh, share with our audience the purpose and the structure of the Brownstone Institute. I started it after the, the lockdowns wouldn't go away. They began in March 20. Uh, 2020, and then it was supposed to be two weeks, and it kept it going on and on. And after a while, the crisis developed: cultural crisis, public health crisis, uh, uh, social crisis, and a cri crisis of arts and, and education. And now we're seeing a crisis in economics. So in in May 21, I realized that we needed a full institution that was trying to, to deal with this epic event. To me, it's uh, compares with World War One or some other uh, major. Mm -hmm. event and, and history. And we needed an institution that was going to be able to respond and talk uh, entirely uh, about the, all the aspects of the lockdowns and, and what it's done. And not just in the interest of uh, um, inspiring resistance and, and research, but then also to point the way towards rebuilding, because it's my own view that we can't just sit by and let this happen to us. We can't do this. We have to fight for civilization and human rights and, and freedom and some kind of a normal good life again. And, and we, we can't just acquiesce to what's happening to us from big pharma, big tech, and big government. Well, it, and, and that, that sounds like a good lead into our, our second question today. Uh, uh, tell our audience about your, your new book, Liberty or Lockdown, which I think was released shortly before the, the main part of the pandemic was resolved. Oh, for sure. Uh, well, I had started writing that book pretty uh, pretty quickly. I, I wrote my first article about the pop prospect of, of lockdowns back in January 2020, because I knew those powers were in place. They had been in place for the previous 15, 16 years. They started back in 2005, this idea that you're going to deal with a pathogen by wrecking uh, people's freedom. It's been around for a long time. And I knew that it was possible they would do it, but I didn't know that it would actually happen. And when it started to unfold, I thought, well, I need to step up and, and, and uh, chronicle this and explain why this is wrong and why it wasn't going to work. Uh, and, and doing so required that I uh, uh, understand something about the history of, of pandemic disease, uh, of, of cell biology and uh, economics and, and uh, you know, the relationship between uh, public health and the idea of human freedom. And so I just began to writing on the book. And then by September the, of that year, it was entirely released and it still holds up. I mean, it's actually interesting because that, <laughs> that book came out before the vaccine was even ready. Yeah. When the vaccine came out, there were a lot of people that assumed that it was going to fix the pandemic and everything was going to go back to normal once enough people got vaccinated. But then it turned out uh, the vaccine had been uh, wildly oversold in its capacity to provide any kind of sterilizing effects. And then, of course, over time, it took another year, but uh, we learned that uh, the vaccinated, uh, you know, while they have temporary protection against uh, um, se severe uh, outcomes, and that's, that's fine, um, it was not capable of contributing to what we're really going for, which is herd immunity. So it didn't stop infection and it didn't stop uh, the spread. And we know that now from data all over the world and also the United States. So this idea that it's a pandemic of the unvaccinated was ridiculous. It was never a pandemic of the unvaccinated. It's just a pandemic. And the vaccines have made, um, I would say, a, a, a minor but a s somewhat uh, important contribution to uh, diminishing uh, um, lost lives uh, uh, among the cohort, which is severely at risk. It's the mandates themselves have led to vast firings and social and political division, a great deal of anger, and it's discredited public health in many ways. And, and it's actually harmed public trust in um, the CDC and in vaccines and the pharmaceutical industry 
generally. So it's been tremendously dangerous. So I don't address the vaccines in the book only because the book came out before the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But uh, the book still holds up because it has a lot of history about past pandemics and how this was an unprecedented uh, attack on freedom and rights. We'd never done anything like this in the past. And, and it didn't work. And we're getting towards endemicity anyway through natural infection and the mask upgrading of immune systems all over the world. I mean, that's how every pandemic begins. That's how every pandemic ends for these kinds of viruses, not through mass vaccination, but through um, exposure and recovery. Right. Well, you know, what's interesting, just a little tidbit that came out, re, you know, regarding World War One and the famous uh, Spanish flu pan pandemic, which is the closest uh, parallel historically, is apparently they, they looked at 30 army bases, 15 had, ex you know, roughly half had e extreme lockdowns and half just proceeded normally. And the death rates were statistically the same. So the, the, the concept that this, this lockdown, we already had the data. In fact, it was US government data by definition of the United States Army. And so it, it's a great shame. And it's interesting because the states like California and New York that had some of the most severe uh, mandates and lockdowns seem to have had just as high, if not higher uh, losses than states like Florida and Texas, and I'm sitting here in Houston, Texas, where uh, things were relaxed more quickly. So it's, it's very interesting. In other words, the objective data seems to clearly bear out what, what, you just, uh, what you just said. By the way, the positivity rate in Harris County, Texas, which is huge, you know, which surrounds Houston, um, is 1.7% today, which is essentially a, a, again, a, a very clear marker that we've achieved herd, herd immunity, uh, at least to this point. And of course, it, things may come back up the other way with the new BA variant, but it doesn't seem that we've, we've really made, uh, you know, much progress beyond the fact that we've achieved herd immunity. Yeah, it's very difficult to know exactly where that threshold is. And, and part of the problem is that with every new variant, the threshold uh, uh, rises further, which sure. is one of the reasons you want to get the pandemic over with as quickly as possible. So if we had never locked down uh, and people had gone about their lives, it's very possible that everything would have ended um, in the uh, late spring or early summer of 2020. And we would have not, not seen these variants, but by delaying, uh, the point of endemicity is as long as we did through these lockdowns and through hiding in our homes and and shutting all uh, churches and bars and and uh, uh, restaurants and and, uh, uh, and introducing capacity restrictions and all these things uh, all we did was provide more time for the variants to emerge and and you know people say that omicron's mild but you know it's it's mild because a lot of the people that that caught it had pre had previous exposure. Um, if you're going into meeting Omicron or this next next subvariant uh, with a completely naive immune system, you can expect to uh, to be sick. You know, and and we're still seeing real problems. Uh, uh, you know, it's fascinating in in the uh, uh, in January of this year. Uh, when things just started opening because people were tired of, of all the uh, lockdowns and everything. Of course, Texas has been open a long time, but yeah. in the Northeast, it, you know, in California, they just started opening up. But, you know, rates of infection and even deaths per million were, were just as high as during the height of lockdowns uh, um, nearly two years earlier. So none of this is based on science. Uh, it, was, it was based on a bad theory and, and a bad practice. And it quite frankly ruined ruined lives, stole two years of education from from children, and traumatized people all over the world. It shattered families and ended travel, wrecked hundreds of thousands of businesses. Yes, and, no, uh, no question about it. It just was a very um, a very strange uh, period in in America. Hey, we have limited time, but I did want to ask my third question, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I, Many Americans are not familiar with Ludwig von Mises, and uh, you are, as far as I can tell, the, the leading expert these days. And would you share a little bit 
uh, about him and in his works and why he's significant. Sure, he was born in Lviv, uh, Ukraine of all places, um, yeah. uh, which was bombed the other day actually. But yeah. uh, and then and then uh, he ended up in Vienna uh, in the the early part of the 20th century as a major economist and wrote a big book on monetary theory, mm -hmm. uh, warning about the dangers of central banking. He was a very good economist and wrote lots of books. One right after the First World War came out in 1919, another one in 1924, another one in 1929 and so on. But in 1934, he was chased out of Austria by the rise of the Nazis and went to Geneva, stayed there for six years and then immigrated to the United States and taught at New York University until his death in 1973. His great book is about a thousand pages. He wrote it in exile in sanctuary in Geneva and thank goodness for that. And my latest article uh, it explains why it's so essential that we have sanctuaries in the world for intellectuals to go. Uh, we didn't know that that crisis was going to happen in the interwar period, but it did. And we didn't know the crisis in our own lives was going to happen, but it did. Yeah. Uh, Brownstone Institute is serving as a kind of a sanctuary for many uh, academics that are being t t thrown out and driven out of, of university life and can't get published due to censorship. And they need a community, they need a, an audience, and they need an opportunity to write their great works. We can't let civilization stop just because some ruling class uh, weirdos uh, claim that it should, you know, in combination with big tech. We can't be intimidated. We have to just keep fighting. And that's what Brownstone is about. And Mises is a good example of that. You know, he immigrated to the United States at the age of 60 um, uh, in 1940. And... No, let me, let me change that. Yeah, that was 1940. Um, and did his best work after after the age of 60. And uh, Well, we, that's inspiring for those of us who are over 60. And of course, you know, when any, anybody tells me they're 60 something, I say terribly young. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, and um, I actually recently done uh, a, a talking head segment on the USA Global Network talking about the evils of age discrimination and that we're, we're wasting so many valuable resources. And I suspect some of the people who are getting comfort at the Brownstone Institute are, uh, are over 60 and could, could uh, impart a lot of knowledge to some of our other generations. Well, if we start paying attention, I, and I hope we do, I, we're listening, we're, we're living in very strange times where uh, with the inflation now, it's, it's rewarding short-term thinking and punishing uh, savers uh, in yes. terrible ways. I and mean, as you well know, if you've been to the store recently um, uh, or uh, uh, you've been to fill up your tank of gas, it's, it's hitting us very hard. These are direct consequences of the pandemic response. The money supply was increased um, almost 50%. Uh, over two years and with six trillion dollars in spending from congress you can't do those kinds of things without having profound devastating economic consequences uh, for everybody it doesn't matter if you're in a red state or a blue state it's it's going to be bad i agree and, and of course uh, you know the bottom line is is that you and i are not making a partisan statement here because both parties have signed on to this uh, wild printing of money and, and throwing money away. And it, it, it's very sad. And yes, indeed, even though Houston um, is, is fairly well known for having a modest cost of living, uh, we've experienced uh, dramatic uh, increases here. Uh, Jeffrey, we're, we're out of time, but I wanted to ask you to tell, tell our audience, what's the best way to get more information about you? Um, I would say the best, the best way is go to the Brownstone Institute. My email is listed there. I'm sure. also on all the major platforms, Getter and Gab and Twitter and, and so on. But um, I really like people to sign up for our emails because that's, that's a good secure way that we can get in contact with you, even if uh, the sensors start shutting down all the big platforms, which they seem to be doing now. So go to brownstone.org. Yeah, yeah. And we're very strong on Getter, by the way. We, we've uh, got a, a, a solid following there. And so that'll be one of the places where this webcast slash podcast will be uh, promoted. And again, uh, Jeffrey, uh, thank you so much. Again, we had a little 
a little bobble uh, getting you uh, online today, but I'm so glad you were patient and joined us. And I wish you all the best with the Brownstone Institute and the fine work you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. And this is Dr. David D. Shine. Thanks for joining us for this special episode of Saving America. And if you've enjoyed it, please subscribe on your favorite platform.